young American medic serving in Iraq survived a sniper's bullet recently. His mother called it a miracle, but perhaps what's even more remarkable is that after he was hit, the medic then saved the life of the man who tried to kill him. I talked with PFC Stephen Chitterer about that day on the battlefield. Here's our soldier story. Let me first ask you, did this day, the day on which you were shot, did it start out any differently than any other day since you've been in country in Iraq? Uh, pretty much started out just like every other day. Just got down the trucks, put your stuff on the truck, get in the truck, get your brief, and let's go. Time to go out and hopefully get some bad guy. So, my understanding is you're on a routine patrol, just doing what you've been doing any number of days in country, in Iraq. And then describe for us what happened and what you remember. What had happened was we were going down one of the routes. Uh, somebody opened up with an automatic rifle, uh, shot at one of our Humvees. We then moved into a, what we call a cordon. You just basically surround off the block and we started searching homes. As we were searching those homes, about halfway through, got another small burst of automatic fire. Then we also got a well-aimed single shot, which most of us automatically take relate to that being a sniper. So after that, we thought we had an idea where the sniper was. We moved around to that block, surrounded that block, but unfortunately we were wrong, and uh, uh, the block we surrounded was actually the one next to it. As you're looking at me, the reason I'm out on that side of the Humvee is uh, we thought the threat was on the opposite side. So I was outside. I felt. I was going to be okay on that side, but unfortunately I wasn't. Stephen, the vest, it saved your life, didn't it? Yes, the, the, the vest definitely saved my life. Uh, we were uh, another plate inside of it, which was what actually stopped around. So that's why I'm here talking to you today. How concerned were you that the video that the world has seen now of this attack on you, how concerned were you that the video was getting out ahead of your ability to even communicate to your family that you were okay. Uh, I was pretty worried about that. Um, right when at first, like the couple nights after, I heard through the rumor mill that uh, I had been released. So I was like, oh man, I haven't even talked to my parents yet. Uh, unfortunately, they were away for the 4th of July down at one of the lakes near us. And uh, it took me about four and a half days before I finally got a hold of them. So I was kind of worried. They got home and there's only like three or four messages from local media trying to contact them. So. I'm just glad I got a hold of them. They heard my voice. That's pretty much. That's the only thing I was worried about. Was just my parents getting worried, seeing the video before they heard from me. Did you talk to them on the phone? Did you email them? And, and, and if you talk to them on the phone, give us a little bit of that conversation. So <laughs> well, it was uh, it was a little nerve wracking at first because uh, my battalion commander was sitting there right over my shoulder, making sure that I called him. So I really didn't. I was trying to keep it all just hush hush and hey, yeah, I'm fine. I'm no worse for the wear. I'm fine. But uh, my battalion commander made me call. I'm like, hey, mom, how you doing? Uh, I just want to start this off. I'm okay, but I don't know if you heard yet, but I got shot the other day and just kind of explained what happened. She got all nervous. And... I said, what do you mean there's a video? He goes, mom, they taped the whole thing. Why? For training. I wasn't, suppo I was, I wasn't supposed to live. It's, it was for training. <laughs> It was the sound more than the actual action. It, and to hear the Iraqis talking about my son and to have him in their sights. For me, the initial feeling was, was anger. Then I started sobbing <laughs> hysterically. I mean, it just, it, it, it was amazing to see how close, how close it came. I said, Steve, they were laughing. He said, no, Mom, they were praying. Well, as I said, we go into battle, we pray, so did I. We were starting to think that, okay, we can do this, we'll be home soon. And then it all just kind of was put right back into perspective, what these guys go through every single day. And it's hard. It's hard. This brought it all home. When was the first moment, and describe that moment for us, when you realized, hey, I've been shot. I could have died. As soon as I hit the ground, I knew I was hit. And uh, I was like, oh man, I got hit. 
But I'm like, well, it doesn't hurt too bad, so I guess I'm okay. So pop back up, got it on the Humvee. And when I get on the Humvee, I take a knee and I kind of open up my vest, and I'm like, whew, all right, no blood, good to go. All right, let's go get them. Well, Stephen, talk to us about that. You actually, you and the, the other members of your team, you actually did go after uh, the person who shot you, and you found that person, didn't you? We uh, chased the vehicle down. We ended up having to disable it. They wouldn't stop for obvious reasons. Uh, one of the gunners on our Humvees uh, shot out the tires on the vehicle, so they ended up bailing out. And uh, they went running into a neighborhood. We chased after them. Uh, eventually, one of our, uh, we had two sections with us that day. One section went down the, uh, the road before they went down. It's kind of as a blocking force. And we kind of went to the uh, street they went down trying to push them towards our other Humvee. And uh, it actually worked for the driver. The driver, uh, just luckily enough, was running, jumped over a fence, and there was our Humvee sitting right there. So that was an easy nab. And then uh, we're going through the houses and trying to talk to the families. Hey, have you seen this guy? Have you seen this guy? I, all the Iraqi people in that area were extremely helpful. Like, oh, yeah, he went this way. He went that way. Uh, we ended up finding a blood trail from uh, the wounds that he had received. Followed that through a few homes. And eventually, uh, we moved to the opposite side where we had captured the driver and started searching those homes. And at that time, the Iraqi army actually helped us. Uh, they showed up and were going to help us search. The very first house they go in, they search out the house, clear it, put it on the roof, and all of a sudden I hear all this screaming. And uh, they're like, oh, he's next door, he's next door. So myself and two of the Iraqi soldiers went outside to the next house, and I uh, was trying to get into the front yard. We couldn't get in through the gate. So I just grabbed him. We th I threw him over the wall. I jumped over the wall after him, just ran up, grabbed him, dragged him out in the yard, patted him down, make sure he didn't have anything else on him. Uh, we cuffed him and bandaged him up and locked him up. Steven, you treated the man who you believe shot you. It's, it's part of the job. I'm a medic. Uh, he put down his arms. He's no threat. I mean, there's no excuse not to. It's just it's what I, anybody should have done and anybody would have done. Steven, someone else could have bandaged him up. You didn't have to do it. You, the person he shot, you didn't have to be the one to bandage him up, but you did. What does that, what does that tell us about you? I want to do is just doing a job. That's it. I'm a medic. It's always hurt. It's my job to make sure they survive. And plus, if he had died, unfortunately, he wouldn't have given us any information. So it's better to keep him alive, see if we can get something out of him, and then just keep him. Then just having that life expire, then you got nothing except for a dead body. So it's kind of worthless after that. You a religious man? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, definitely, he was definitely watching over me, definitely protecting me on that one. Can't uh, deny that. Well, that's a soldier story. Steven says he can't wait to be reunited with his family in Minden, New York. That's in September.